Hello everyone, I'm Miss Davis and today we're going to focus in on plant structure. Think of plant structure as plant anatomy. We're going to focus on the anatomy of flowering plants which are the angiosperms. Angiosperms are a very diverse group. They range from the cacti in the desert to water lilies to the giant sequoia trees that we see here in this picture. No matter what type of angiosperm we're looking at, they have two basic systems present. A plant's anatomy is divided into two organ systems. We have the shoot system, which is above ground, and we have the root system, which is below ground. Now, the shoot system is composed of stems and leaves. So we see here we have stems and we have leaves. The root systems, of course, are going to be composed of the root. So let's look at the stems first. Now, stems are the first organ we're going to discuss, which support the leaves and the flowers of the plant. They also transport substances between the roots and the leaves. So they're going to transport water up, but they'll also transport sugars down. Now, stems have two types of buds that are used for growth. We see up here at the top, we have the terminal bud. The terminal bud is on the tip of the stem and allows the plant to grow up against gravity. Now, the axillary buds are here. The axillary buds allow the plant to produce new growths or new branches off the stem, so this is going to help the stem grow out. Now, the part of the stem that these axillary buds and new leaves are located are called nodes, and you can see them here, they're called nodes. The area between these nodes are known as the internode. These are some terms that you're going to need to know. Now, let's move on to the second organ that is also part of the shoot system, which is the leaf. The leaf is composed of two distinct structures. They're composed of the blade, which is the foliage part of the leaf that you see here. It's the foliage part. It's the part we think of as being the leaf, and it's going to perform the photosynthesis. And then we have the petiole. The petiole is the little stalk that's going to attach the leaf. Now, the third plant organ we want to discuss are the root. The roots is the only organ that is part of the root system. Now, the root's main goal is to anchor the plant, but also to absorb water and minerals for the plant. The root is also able to grow down into the ground due to the presence of this root tip. Okay, it's kind of similar to the terminal bud growing up against gravity. The root tip is going to allow the root to grow down in search of water. Also, in a unique structure in roots are these root hairs. They're these tiny extensions off of the root. These root hairs increase the surface area of the root and allow for greater absorption of water and minerals. Now, you may recall from the previous lectures that angiosperms are divided into two groups. This is because there are some structural differences between these two groups. So let's talk about these structural differences for monocots and eudicots. The first main difference between the monocots and the eudicots is the number of cotyledons, okay, or cotyledons in the seed. A cotyledon is a seed leaf. So monocots only have one seed leaf present. That's what mono means. And so they have one seed leaf present, which you see here. Okay. Eudicots have two. That's where the dye comes in. So they have two cotyledons, two seed leaves that are going to be present. And this is where the names come from. Next, the root internal and external structures are going to differ. The root's internal structures of the monocot has the vascular tissue, the xylem and phloem, arranged in a ring, which you see here. So they're arranged in a ring for the monocot. In the eudicot, however, the xylem is located or organized in the center and makes a star shape. Okay, you can see the star shape here. And then the phloem fills in these areas around the rays of the star. Okay, so there's different organization of their xylem and phloem. There's also differences in their external root. With their external root structure, um, the roots of the monocot are fibrous, which you see here in this picture. They form fibers, which is like a network. This is one reason why it's really hard for you to pull up like a handful of grass. Grass roots are an example of fibrous roots. The root of a eudicot, however, consists of one main root, which you see here. The one main root coming down with small offshoot branches. These are called a tap root. The tap root structure is what we would see kind of like with a carrot or a dandelion, the longer root with little um, offshoots. When we move on to the stem, stem structure that has the differences, the monocots have their vascular bundles and the stems scattered. So you'll notice here in the picture they're scattered randomly. However, in the eudicot, these are going to be organized into a ring around the, the edge. So there's real organization here in the eudicot. Besides the external 
um, root structure, all of these characteristics would be hard to use in determining if the plant is a monocot or eudicot. You don't have the ability to cut open the plant, put it on a microscope, and look to see um, the differences there. So let's look at the external anatomy that can help you determine the difference. The first are the leaves. The veins of the leaf differ between the two groups. The leaves in a monocot have parallel veins, like you see here in this picture. This would be seen in like the blade of a grass, of, of grass or the leaf of a lily. Now the veins in a eudicot, however, branch. And again, you can see those here in this picture. They have a branch here, and then they're going to cross that center branch. These would be like the leaves of a rose bush or an oak tree. So you could look at these leaves and determine whether or not it's a monocot or a eudicot. Also, the flower structures are going to differ. Monocot flower parts come in threes or multiples of three. So they may have petals that have three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, and so on. All of those numbers can be divided by three. Eudicots, though, have multiples of fours or fives. So if we look at the four side, they could have four, eight, twelve, sixteen. If we look at the five side, they could have five, ten, 15, 20. Okay, so they can be divided by 4 or 5. Well, there's a little bit of overlap there. If you notice, 12 can be divided by 3 or 4, or 15 can be divided by 3 or 5. So sometimes the flower structures can be confusing on determining whether or not the plant is a monocot or eudicot. So if they have 12 or 15 petals, then you would need to look at their leaf structure to determine whether it's a monocot or a eudicot. Hopefully this will help you with your information on your lab where you were looking at monocot versus eudicot. Plants have three main types of tissue that can be found in roots, stems, and leaves. First, let's discuss the dermal tissue. The dermal tissue is composed of the epidermis and the periderm. It is the outermost layer of the tissues or the plant. The function of the dermal tissue is for protection, but it's also going to help prevent water loss, especially in the leaves. Next is the ground tissue. The ground tissue makes up the bulk of the plant and performs many functions such as metabolism, like photosynthesis, but they can also be used for storage or support of the plant. The last type of tissue I want to talk about here is the vascular tissue. Vascular tissue is composed of xylem and phloem. This xylem and phloem is going to be important in transporting nutrients like water, sugar, and minerals. Now, let's take a closer look at, at each of these tissue types. The dermal tissue, also known as the epidermal tissue, covers the entire body of the plant. So it covers the whole body of the plant. Some of the cells of the dermal tissue are modified. Okay, and so we see the, dermal the epidermal tissue here in this particular picture. Some of these are modified, and an example of this is the guard cells. In leaves, there are small openings in the underside of the leaf, which are called stomata. So the opening here is called the stomata, and you can see it here in the center. The stomata are important because they allow gas exchange. They allow carbon dioxide into the plant for photosynthesis and oxygen out of the plant. However, when the stomata are open, the plant can also lose water through this process. And this process is called transpiration. Well, we don't want these holes just to be open all the time for the plant. So modified dermal cells called guard cells, which you see here on the sides, these are the guard cells here. These modified cells, the guard cells, line the stomata. When the plant has plenty of water and needs to get carbon dioxide in, the guard cells will be open like you see in the picture. So they are open like this, creating that hole. However, if the plant is losing too much water or has lost too much water that's not being replaced, those guard cells will close up the hole like you see here. So the hole is no longer present. Well, that means carbon dioxide can get in, but no water is being lost. And so the plant has to do a balance between these two to prevent water loss versus doing photosynthesis. Now, the stem and leaves of a plant also have another adaptation to help prevent water loss. Um, this is where the cuticle comes in. This is this waxy covering that you see here on top of the epidermis. Um, it's a thin, clear layer of wax and is produced by the epidermis of the stems and leaves. Since this cuticle is made of wax, it holds water inside because the wax is a fat, which means that it's going to create a barrier. Now, a specialized type of dermal cell in the roots, however, are what we call root hairs. 
These root hairs increase the surface area of the root so that they can absorb the greatest amount of water and minerals possible. So this allows them to be able to absorb uh, the maximum amount of um, water and minerals. So these are just some specialized si uh, cells that are part of the dermal tissue. Now, ground tissue is composed of three main types of cells that make up the majority of the plant. Now, the parenchyma cells, or the parenchyma cells, are the least specialized cells. Um, they are known as the basic plant cell. So the parenchyma cells in the leaves are going to contain lots of chloroplasts, and they're going to be doing most of the photosynthesis. Okay, so they're going to have a lot of the photosynthesis side. The colochyma cells, or the colenchyma cells, have a thicker primary cell wall, so they're going to provide more support for the plant. Now, this is a flexible support, and it's going to be found in the non-woody plants, okay, the plants with no wood. When you think about colenchyma or colenchyma cells, think about celery, okay, since they're composed primarily of this type of cell, okay, celery kind of bends, but it does give it a lot of structure. Last are the sclerochyma cells or the sclerenchyma cells. These are non-living at maturity, so they're not alive at this point, and you can see them here. They have a thick secondary cell wall, and they provide structural or strong support for the plant. Okay, um, These create what we would call plant fibers. These fibers that can be taken from like cotton or flax, and they can be woven into fabric. Um, also, hemp fibers can be taken, and they can be woven or made to make strong rope. So these are going to have the ability to provide lots of structure. Now, like we talked about earlier, vascular tissue is composed of xylem and phloem. Both function in the transport of substances, but they move different substances. Xylem is composed of vessel elements and what we would call trachads, which act as a pipeline. They're going to move water and minerals up from the roots to the leaves. Now, these mature cells are non-living when they are functioning as this pipeline. So these cells are no longer living, it's just the casing that's left behind. Phloem, on the other hand, uh, moves sugars made in the leaves to the other parts of the plant, whether it's the other parts of the shoot, like flowers and the stem, or to the roots. The phloem is composed of two types of cells. Okay, they're made out of the sieve tube members and the companion cells. Now, the sieve tube members make up the pipeline for the sugars, but they are living, but they lack a nucleus. So the nucleus is what normally controls the cell, and they lack this. So the companion cells do have a nucleus, and they're going to help the sieve tube members. They're going to keep them healthy. They're going to keep them doing the job they're supposed to be doing, and so they're kind of managing the sieve tube member cells. Now, this pipeline system is extremely important for tall plants, such as this giant sequoia tree in this picture. The water needs to be moved from the roots to the leaves for photosynthesis, but the sugars need to be moved from the leaves to the rest of the tree for energy. So all of these tissues are going to be important in this movement. Now remember that all these tissues we discussed, dermal, ground, and vascular, are located in the roots, stems, and leaves. In your portfolio, you're going to be required to draw and label these within the cross-section of a root and a cross-section of a stem, and in your lab, you're going to be looking at a cross-section of the leaf. So please pay attention to your book um, for those particular structures. Now before we finish up this lecture, let's hit on plant growth. Plants can grow two ways, primary or secondary. Primary growth is when the plant increases in length, so it's going to grow either up or down, okay? It's going to increase in length. Now, the Mary stem is the region of the plant with actively dividing cells that help with growth. These cells, though, are what we would call unspecialized. They don't have a particular job yet. All they're there is to increase the size of the plant. As those cells mature, they're going to become specialized. They'll either become ground tissue, epidermal tissue, or vascular tissue. So guys, think of these as being stem cells. They're like the stem cells of the plant. The stem cells can divide and then they become specialized for a certain type of job. Now the tip of the stem and the root are called the apical meristem. So here's the tip of the stem that's growing and down here is going to be the tip of the root. Okay, These are going to have cells that are actively dividing to increase the um, height or depth of the plant. Now, 
The Mary stem in the root you're going to notice has what we call a root cap on it. You can see the root cap here. This is a set of cells that helps protect these delicate dividing cells because in the root they're actually having to dig through the ground or grow down through the ground. So you see this root cap as protection in the root whereas you do not see a cap here in the apical Mary stem of a stem because they're only growing up against air. Now, secondary growth is when the roots or stems are going to grow in girth. Okay, that's going to be in width. They're going to get wider. And we see this really good in wooded plants. So we're going to use the example with the wooded plant. This girth is due to what we call secondary xylem and phloem. Okay, secondary because it's the second group that we're going to see. This is produced by what we call vascular cambrium, and this is another type of meristem tissue. Now, as these cells grow and mature, they create wood. Now, they can have heartwood, which is going to be towards the center, like you see here in this picture, and then they have sapwood on the outside. Okay, those are the two types of wood. At the edges of the tree, there's a cork cambium that's going to be present, and the cork is, in, is responsible for producing bark. This bark is going to help waterproof the tree and support and protect that secondary xylem and phloem. Now, the secondary growth in trees also creates growth rings, and you can see those here within the um, picture. You can see the rings that are going around. These growth rings are going to help be able to help calculate the age of the tree. Each ring represents a year. So if the rings are wider, that was a good year of plant growth. If the rings are closer together, then it wasn't so good. Maybe there, weren't enough, um, there wasn't enough water that year. It was a drought or um, something. Maybe the plant was sick with some sort of disease. And so we'll see this growth is going to be affected by outside factors. So they can help us understand that. So again, these rings are going to help us be able to determine the age of the, the tree. Now again, guys, these lectures that I'm developing here are not intended to take the place of your assigned reading. You still need to be reading your book. However, I'm hoping that me presenting some of this material that's maybe a little harder to understand will help answer some questions you might have and help better prepare you for your test. So please make sure you're still doing your assigned reading, and I hope these lectures are helping.